Woohoo! Clear skies! Guys, we're finally having clear skies. It's been quite a while, a couple of weeks, something like that, since I last had clear skies. So I'm super excited. The half moon is there. It's getting fuller by the day, so I have to take advantage of, uh, of the time that I have. There's uh, a few clouds, streaming clouds up there. But overall, it's clear. It's been a while. I'm super excited. And today we're going to image... Well, actually, first I'm going to get the equipment out so that I don't waste a second. So I'll be right back. This whole setup here is super cool because I can just carry it, maybe not with one hand, but with two hands. And I have here in my hand the ZWAM5 mount, which is a loaner mount from ZW. So unfortunately, I don't own it. And I have my Celestron C6 Hyperstar here on top of it, which is an F2 telescope, perfect for deep sky objects. And at the top here, I have a new dew shield that is super custom. I'll go into it later in the video. It's amazing. So stay tuned. Let me get this set up. To set up this telescope, since I have to set it up from scratch uh, each time, since it's a loner unit, I don't want to leave it outside under a cover, but I know the general orientation of the North Celestial Pole, because since this mount is an equatorial mount, uh, I have to orient this axis here, this line, to the North uh, Celestial Pole. Or if I were in the Southern Hemisphere, it would be the South uh, Celestial Pole. And this will allow the mount to track perfectly well. So this is the first thing that I need to do before I start to image. And for that, I'm going to be using the uh, free software Nina with its three point polar align plugin. I featured this plugin on the channel before but it never hurts to look at it again uh, if you're bored about it just like skip forward in the video because after that I'm just going to go ahead and image I believe I'm gonna go with Leo's triplet. This is a target that's three beautiful little galaxies. A couple of years ago, I took an image of it with um, a ZW ASI 533MC Pro camera, which is a relatively small square format sensor camera with a very tight field of view. And I had used um, an 800 millimeter Newtonian telescope at the, at the time, which zooms in a lot. This one is 300 millimeter focal length, so it zooms in less. And it's also with a far bigger sensor, uh, APS-C size, so I'll have a much wider field of view, much less zoom. And I'm gonna see in the end whether I'll be able to combine those two images, and I have no idea. With this particular setup, I am going to be using uh, this filter here, which is the IDAS GNB filter, which is a filter specifically for nebulae and for galaxies. It's, it lets in specific wavelengths of light, including non-visible light in infrared to try and capture details in galaxies in very light polluted conditions, just like I have here in Tokyo under a half full moon. But for now, let's do the polar alignment together and we'll do it quickly, more or less precisely. Some, sometimes it doesn't pay to do too much polar alignment. Okay, I've turned off the light. So because I'm going to be using the main camera of this telescope to actually take pictures of the stars so the telescope can estimate uh, where the celestial North Pole is and give me instructions on how I should move the azimuth and altitude axis on the mount itself uh, without using the mount controller with using the knobs that are on the side to adjust its uh, rotation axis. So right now I am in Nina and for this to work you want to make sure that under plugins you have searched for under the available tab uh, the one called a three-point polar line. And you can see I have already uh, installed it here, but to install it, you can just go to any of the uh, plugins under the available tab. And for me, it's uh, three point polar alignment. It's already installed, so there's nothing for me to do. But if I wanted to install something else, like moon angle, for example, I just click on it and I click install. And this is one of the things that makes Nina so special and so amazing because so many plugins are uh, available that really make it amazing, amazing, amazing. Anyway, with the three-point polar line uh, plugin installed and after restarting your, uh, your Nina instance, you want to connect to at least your mount. So here for me is the ASI uh, mount here and your camera and my camera is already uh, connected as well. So I've connected those two and you want to make sure that you are more or less in focus with your main camera. So I'm using my main camera and not my guide camera. So I'm gonna take a one second 
exposure, which should reveal a couple of stars, and it will tell me whether I am in focus or not. And yes, I can see some stars there, and so they're not there enough for uh, an operation called plate solving to actually work, meaning that Nina will be able to look at the star field and determine where the star, the, the scope is actually pointed. Actually, it's not Nina that's going to do that, it's a uh, software called uh, ASTAP in my case. And for this to work, you make sure you want to make sure that under options plate solving, you have set up your plate solver. The one that I prefer by far is ASTAP. And this is a topic in and of itself, hard to set up your plate solver. Uh, but effectively, you want to download a free program called ASTAP. I'll put the link down in the description. You want to get download from the same website a catalog of stars, install both, and then under here, uh, in the plate solving options, you want to put ASTAP, select the executable, which by default would be under program files, ASTAP, ASTAP.exec. Typically, you can leave everything to default values and just under plate solving, you put ASTAP as the plate solver. This should make it possible for uh, everything to work, although there is one more thing to do. It is to make sure that your telescope information under options equipment is also correct, with your focal length in particular being very important. And you also want to double check that the pixel size of your camera is correct. Typically, it is set automatically unless you are using ASCOM drivers for your camera. Sorry, this gets super involved super quickly but I am going to assume that you have the uh, everything set up already uh, properly and uh, I'm going to go forward with the three-point polar line uh, plugin in Nina. So again, you need to have the camera connected, the mount connected, and plate solving set up for this to work. You do not need visibility to the celestial pole for this to work. And under the imaging tab of Nina here, you will have uh, this icon here that will appear, the three-point polar alignment. If you click it or and click it again, it acts as a switch and it adds a tab here in the main pane of the imaging tab of Nina with your uh, three-point polar alignment uh, features. In here, you can uh, start you can tell Nina to start from the current position, for instance. So you could point your telescope somewhere in the sky where you have sky visibility, depending on whether you're in a balcony, for, in for instance, or whether you have restricted visibility, and then run the sequence. For me, I will start from this, uh, uh, from the default position, which is basically pointed uh, roughly north. Uh, and I am going to say that my exposure time will be one second, otherwise it can take a lot of time. And because I don't have a super narrowband filter, um, I, one second should be enough. Once I click play, what's going to happen is that the scope is going to move uh, to the left, like uh, counterclockwise from my point of view. And it will then move counterclockwise clockwise by a few degrees twice more. Each time it will do a plate solve to realize where it is and it will use those plate solves to compute where the celestial pole is compared to where the axis of rotation is pointing. So let me click the play button and you can see immediately the, the scope starts slewing. It's now at the first point, it will take an exposure, it will solve it and then it will move to the second point. Here it is, moving to the second point, and again, taking an exposure and solving. And finally, moving to the last point, the third point. Okay, and here I see the results of uh, the alignment. We can see that my le uh, left-right or east-west alignment is not very good, four degrees off, and I should move the telescope to the right. And my altitude error, though, is pretty good, although I will need to move the mount upwards and I'll be using the nubs on the mount to do that. Although for the left, right or east, west uh, alignment, I'm just going to move slightly the tripod itself. Boom. And uh, we're going to see soon the result in Nina of this manipulation with the tripod. And here we are, we are much closer <laughs> simply by moving the tripod and now I'm going to use the azimuth bolts 
on the mount to finish the operation. It obviously helps to have the tripod relatively level. You don't need to be super level because this is an equatorial mount, so the only thing that matters is getting the polar alignment correct. Once the polar alignment is correct, the mount really doesn't care whether it was uh, level to start with or not, but when we're using a polar alignment technique like this one, the instructions that, that Nina gives us to move left or right or up and down are based on the assumption that your tripod is relatively level. And so I will keep adjusting the azimuth, like the, uh, the horizontal axis of the mount until I get this figure, the azimuth error down to maybe 10 or, or less uh, arc minutes. And here we are, I'm just one arc minute away on the azimuth axis. Now I need to raise the mount a little bit. And for that, I will be using the altitude knob here. And one of the tricks that I have is that I, there are um, bolts that are made to secure the mount in place. Uh, both on the azimuth axis and the altitude axis, I have those half tightened to start with. Because when they're half tightened, it's enough to keep the mount stable. And uh, if I then end up fully tightening them, I can do so without affecting the polar alignment too much. Whereas if I start from fully loose bolts on the side, then uh, tightening them might move the polar alignment more than I want. And you can see now my uh, altitude uh, is almost no error and I just need to move the telescope slightly left and there we are we have a perfect polar alignment just 35 arc seconds of error in just a few minutes even demonstrating while I am doing it and this works absolutely amazing so I am just going to stop the procedure and we can have a second quick look at the settings here um, where this setting basically tells us how much the telescope will move in between the three positions that it uh, took images on. And here we have 10 degrees. So uh, move to the first position, 10 degrees left, take a second image, 10 degrees left, take a third image. You can reverse the direction here by choosing direction east toggle on or off. Right now it moved actually towards the west, but whatever. Uh, but you can change that. Meh. And uh, the, uh, the very important setting that I really like if you don't have visibility to the pole is start from current position because then you can manually point the scope wherever you want. And if you know that uh, rotating to the left, the scope will be able to just like take uh, 20 degrees to the left with three total positions, it will use that instead of, uh, of starting from a given position whose coordinates are this. So that can be super useful. And then something to not forget is the exposure time. The shorter the better because otherwise you're waiting quite a bit until you see the result of each small adjustment that you're making to the polar alignment. Anyway, now that we're ready, I am just going to quickly start a sequence on uh, M66, which is one of the galaxies of Leo's triplet. So as usual, I'm going to start by going to the uh, framing tab. I'm going to select M66 in here and select it as a target and select it uh, here as a target. Click on load image, which should give me a preview of how M66 looks like compared to my field of view of, uh, in the telescope. While we're waiting, I'm just going to tell the uh, mount to go home, simply because I like having the mount back on its home position. And here we have uh, the framing I can put the center right in between all of the galaxies. In this particular case, the rotation of my telescope almost doesn't matter. So here I have my framing. Um, I am almost ready to go, so I'm just going to do as usual, add target to sequence. I'm gonna use one of my own sequence templates here. And we are on M66, everything is good. Uh, here you can see I, I get alarm kind of uh, icons. This is because I haven't connected my focuser or my filter or anything. So I'm gonna put my manual filter wheel, which is a fake filter wheel, but it allows me to save in my exposures what filter I was, I was using, which is exactly the IDAS GNB filter. My focuser, uh, which is the uh, Celestron USB focuser. The telescope is connected, but I also need to connect my guider. And I need to remove the cap on the guide scope, quite important.
Okay, we should be ready. I'll go back to my sequence now that I have everything connected. The warning signs are gone and I can do things such as, what will I do? Uh, I'm going to say that I want to loop until the target is less than 30 degrees uh, near the horizon. So I'm going to put a loop until altitude below and this is 30 degrees, perfect. We're gonna take exposures that are going to be 60 seconds long. That's a bit too long for Tokyo, but uh, that allows me to have fewer exposures to stack in the end, and uh, stack, waiting for the stack to be done is always a long time, so the fewest exposures, the better. And I'm going to, to dither every 10 frames so that we get uh, exp uh, dithering every 10 minutes, which should be uh, sufficient. And every... 10 exposures as well, I am going to evaluate whether the target has drifted away from the center of the field of view and recenter as necessary. Then I shouldn't forget in my templates to add a, a sequence startup, which because I've already cooled the camera and unparked the scope is not really necessary, but then we have it. And I want to add my uh, sequence end, which is my own uh, template, which will uh, warm the camera, park the scope, send me a notification tell me that uh, the session is done and will also disconnect the equipment this disconnect feature by the way is part of a plugin uh, which is connector plugin here so you can see how nina pl plugins are everywhere and they make your life so much easier it's amazing i love those uh, anyway go back to the sequence we should be good so i am going to quickly double check this yes we're going to cool the camera it's already cold we're going to unpack this the scope this is our target i'm going to get any f oops i'm going to get any failures um in on my phone as a notification immediately uh we're going to slew and center the car target run the autofocus start the guiding the uh meridian flip will be done automatically i'll have an automatic a uh, autofocus after an increase in hfr and we're gonna do guiding, we're gonna center after drift, and we're gonna take exposures until the target is less than 30 degrees. And then we're gonna end the sequence. Once it's done, everything's good. I'm gonna click on the play button. My sh scope should stop moving. And before I disturb the scope in its imaging, I am going to run away from the balcony because it's a big slab of wood and walking around vibrates everything. So I'll see you back inside tomorrow once the sequence is done. And here's my telescope the following day. It is patiently waiting uh, back to its home position as it was basically following the instructions of Nina throughout the night. And you can see my new dew shield here, which is actually 3D printed based on the design that's been sent to me by one of my subscribers, uh, Alex Miosch. And uh, it's super cool because you are able to change the filter on the fly through a little door here on the inside, I can actually go and reach for the filter drawer. So I don't have to remove the lens hood to change the filter, which is super cool for Hyperstar. I also have an end that guides the cable to the camera to avoid as much as possible um, star spikes or that kind of stuff that we have for Hyperstar. And I'm able to just close the telescope with the normal cap. So this is a really cool dew shield for Hyperstar. I also have my cables going through the slots here. It's super well done. Alex is apparently planning on selling his design for people with 3D printers to uh, print them themselves. Uh, but like, you know, let us know in the comments if, you're, if, you, if you'd be interested in 3D printing this. It did take me over like 30 hours or so <laughs> to print the whole thing though. And now it's time to actually look at the results of our imaging. And one night, target kind of close to the moon in terms of arc distance. I didn't expect much and I was right not to expect much. This is the result on the left here. Uh, this is what I got. And you can zoom in on the galaxies. There's not a lot of details. And on top of that, there's like this huge halo here. There's a, a kind of a line that goes like this. Yeah, it's not great. Um, so I... And this, for reference, is the unprocessed image. So these are both unpro unprocessed, but this is what I got uh, two or three years ago um, 
with around 13 to 14 hours of imaging time during the new moon, right? I think it was across three nights around the new moon. And it was with my R200 SS uh, telescope. So focal lengths of 800 or 760 millimeters. So much, much higher than the focal lengths that I have on my Hyperstar. And so just looking at those two images, I know I am not going to combine them. I'd be crazy to, because look, look at the details. It's just not even the same. And this is very interesting because it reminds me of uh, one of the drawbacks that uh, Luke from Lucomatico YouTube channel mentioned about the IDAS GNB filter, which uh, I was using during that night, which is that because it uses infrared on some galaxies, it can hide the dust lanes because infrared penetrates those dust lanes quite well. And so the dust lanes are kind of gone, right? So there's several factors in this. There's the moon, there's the difference of focal lengths, but there's also the fact that we're including infrared in this one and not in that one. So it's very interesting to show that the GNB filter is not for all galaxies, at least from what I can tell. Okay, but even though we don't want to combine those images because the one I had three years ago is clearly superior, I'm going to go through the steps of how to actually uh, combine them, even though they're widely different focal lengths. And uh, yeah, let's let's see how it works. And at the same time, I'll try to see and repro see if I can reprocess this uh, old image. And for information, this was my original processing of the image, which was not bad at all. But I feel that with the new tools that I have at my dispos disposal, like Blur Exterminator, Noise Exterminator, and Star Exterminator, I can do better than that. So let's have fun, right? That's uh, just an excuse to revisit an old image, because why not? And um, so I'm having so much fun with this hobby. <laughs> So anyway, uh, what we're going to do is, uh, well, I'm just like, I already did part of the processing uh, up until the combination. So the usual stuff, right? So I'm only interested in the galaxies at the center here. And are there halos there? Yes, there are halos. Bad. IDAS, bad. I didn't notice them before. I wonder what caused them. There was some fog in the, the sky. So I was kind of hmm, something I'll look at some more later. Anyway, I am going to uh, first crop only on the image, on the part of the image that interests me, then using star exterminator. Oh, no. Then what I did was uh, a geometry and mirror because I'm using hyperstar single mirror. Uh, so the uh, image is uh, mirrored. Okay. And so I unmirrored the image, then I removed the stars, then based on uh, the starless image, I run a very aggressive dynamic background extraction and place back the stars. We're good. So I detailed this method method already in a few videos. It comes from Adam Block, um, master of Pix Insights. Highly recommend. And my next step was a simple image solving. This is because to run the photometric or spectrophotometric color calibration, you actually need to know the coordinates. So for that, I use a script image analysis and image solver. Um, and once that's done, I was able to run the photometric color calibration, which uh, requires me to do another uh, stretch. And here we are. And then I can run the um, uh, blur exterminator followed by noise exterminator. So this is what we get. And after that, I stretched the image using the uh, dark icon, dark archon, easy soft stretch uh, script that I have here. So if you're familiar with my videos, this is the exact path that I take with all of my processing because I'm lazy. And you can do better, but Nah, at what cost? Cost of time, cost of laziness. I have other stuff to do. I have videos to make. <laughs> uh, and uh, we'll do exactly the same thing for the other image, right? So first, I think I crop it, yeah. Then remove the stars. Dynamic background extraction on the starless image. Place back the stars in the image. Then the solving of the image, followed by the color calibration. And uh, then the blur exterminator. Uh, noise exterminator, and then we stretch. And so here we are with our two images uh, stretch. How would I go about combining them when, well, now that I've mirrored the, or the, my hyperstar image to make sure that they have like kind of this, not the same orientation, but the same mirroring uh, across both images, I can simply run the star alignment tool. And for that, it's under here, star alignment. Where are you? Here you are. And uh, I can 
on the reference image select a view, I will say that my reference image is integration, the one on the left that I took uh, yesterday. And the uh, one on the right will be the file, the view that I want to uh, align to it. And I can just click on the apply global and this will create a new aligned image. Okay, I have my new aligned image. How do I combine both images? Uh, there's multiple methods. I could use pixel math to say like, I want half this image and have this, that, that image to be aligned. So I can, let's try to do that, right? So it's not gonna give a good result. It's gonna give a worse result than my moonless image, but that's how things are. Also, you have no idea how doing this makes me want to buy the R200 SS again, regardless. So I'd be, let me reset, go to the expression editor, and I'm just going to say that I would just take like integration times 0 0.5 plus uh, the registered um, file times 0 0.5, right? Half, half. That's one way to do it. And with fa half, fa half, half, I can do that. I can say that I want to create a new image. It is going to be an RGB color image, and I can apply to, car to target, and there we are. So we have only the center workable. So what would I do then? I'd simply do a dynamic crop to crop on the um, on the center of the image, simply enough. So dynamic crop, here you are. And dynamic crop, something to not forget is you can set a, a rectangular or a square size and just rotate it, rotate it by selecting outside of the rectangle so that you can very easily adapt to whatever angle of rotation your image has. And let's see, let's crop roughly. Here we are, apply the dynamic crop. And here we have a combined image, right? So that's not too bad, right? But it's definitely, I think it's definitely less good than the other image. So that's one way of doing things. And another way of doing things would be instead of using pixel math, where I said like take half of that image and add a half of that image to it, you could simply do an LRGB combination and say, that uh, this image that I took yesterday becomes the luminance channel for the new image. For that, I need to extract the luminance, which is the black and white information of the image. And then I can use the LRGB integration uh, combination process to uh, unselect RGB, select L as my integration L here, the only black and white image, and then apply it to the other image. And this will complete in, in a way the image, but we're actually losing detail by doing so. So on this image, bef this is now before, after. <laughs> this is not the good way to, um, to combine this image. So I'm not going to combine the images, but you can see how it can work. Another way would be to extract each of the color channels and try to combine them one by one. Uh, there's many, many ways it can work, but pff, with this image, I'm not going to bother. So now that I've seen what I wanted to try today and I can do it successfully, except that it's meaningless with the data that I have, also known as don't mix new moon data with half moon data, simple enough. Uh, I can just have some fun with the main image. And so for that, I think I'm just going to take a luminous mask. Here we are. I'm just gonna go super simple and I think I'm gonna love the results. Okay. Luminance mask, I apply it to the image. If we look at how that looks like, um, the mask is masking the background, but keeping the stars and the galaxies uh, available. Okay. And then I can simply do some curves transformations. So that's my old three years old uh, image. And so I am going to open a preview, go to saturation and increase the saturation. Let's do that a few times. This is so cool. Oh my word. Okay, that's a bit too much, but let's, let's go like that. Oh my word. Oh, this is so nice. Look at this. I didn't have to do anything. Oh, come on. Let me, let me compare to the old processing that I had. Okay, and you can see immediately like details in the galaxies, oh my word, the new, oh, those new AI tools are amazing. Such a result. I had to murder the background uh, previously, but now it's it's no longer necessary. And I could even like maybe have some fun by removing the mask and then do some more curves. 
like a very simple contrast curve and actually a, a generalized hyper hyperbolic stretch might be nice here but okay let's apply this and wow oh wow the difference oh my word there's so much more potential in those new tools and then we could do some hdr multi-scale transform here we are i'm just going to to lightness lightness mask we're going to apply six layers see what happens oh my word so much detail oh my word did i take this image from tokyo this is so much better than before okay I, this is a bit too aggressive for my my taste though so i'm gonna try seven layers okay that's a, that's a bit more like it Oh yeah, so in the end, this uh, video ended up about reprocessing an image from three years ago, because why not? That's the fun with astrophotography. I love this, the new tools that we have. I hope this made you want to reprocess absolutely every mis image that you've ever taken. So I really apologize. This video was completely all over the place, but we're just past April's Fool. So I just can't say April's Fool, like no topic for this video. We're just like messing around uh, and that's pretty much what it is i hope you enjoyed anyway uh and i hope it like it reminds you of the joy of this hobby despite all of the frustrations that it can have and remember whenever you get like a, a result that just like you know isn't awesome although like i'd be i would have been super happy with this image like five years ago uh just taking this stride it's fun it's a good excuse to do something else have fun hobby is for fun have fun doing it and with those wise words, I want to thank you so much for watching this video. Um, leave a comment, like, subscribe, welcome to the channel. And if you feel very generous, you can join the channel as a member, become a Patreon. Seriously, you guys make the channel possible. Thank you so, 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 so much. With that, don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.